Well, let me just say thank you, Miles, and to all of our worship team, to Derek and the whole team. If you don't know Miles, Miles is one of our summer interns with the Leadership Institute, and it's a gift to have you with us. Thank you for blessing us this morning. We're grateful for that. And let me also say to Andrew, I too love Chapel Street Church. <laughs> anyway, I couldn't help it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are all to us. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we ignore it and we live like it's not true. But just hearing it sung, lifting our voices, we're reminded you indeed are all. So you who are all now speak to us through your word. We pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. In 1988, a U.S. company launched a uh, marketing campaign that would take them from $877 million in sales, which is pretty good, to over $9 billion in sales in just 10 years. The whole campaign was three words. Anybody know the company? Nike? Just do it. I used to have a poster of Michael Jordan with his tongue out, just do it, you know, in my room. Some of you know that slogan. We still say it, right? It, it captured the imagination of the whole nation, whether you were a sports fanatic or not. Everybody knew that phrase, just do it. What was it about those three words that were so captivating, that, that worked, that sort of clicked? Well, for one thing, how many of you have, have, have had ideas, intentions, or thoughts in your mind about things you wanted to do or accomplish, but you just haven't gotten around to doing it? Anybody? Yeah, me too. Got a long list. I've got notebooks full of things I intend to do, but haven't done. There's something compelling about the simple, direct, straightforward statement, just do it, just do it. Well, the section of the book of James we're going to look at this morning is sort of in a way like James's version of just do it. It's a, a hotly debated passage and a very, very important passage for us in understanding our own faith. We're in a series called Street Level Faith, studying this letter, this ancient letter of James, the younger half-brother of Jesus, who wrote this letter to the church in general, the scattered Christians that were, had left Jerusalem under persecution and, and were now scattered around the Roman world. Well, at least Judea, Samaria, and parts of the Mediterranean, Asia Minor. He writes this letter to be circulated and read aloud in churches. And we've seen that James is not a guy who mixes words. He's direct. He's straightforward, sometimes even harsh. And his primary concern is not theolo theology or doctrine. It's he sort of assumes you believe in Jesus. And like the song we sang, he's all to us. He assumes if he is all to you, what should your life look like? How should you live? What should that translate to in your life if he's really indeed all to you? And that's what he's concerned with. And he makes a statement in this passage that, well, we'll just read it and see. Let's open to James 2, verses 14 through 26. If you don't have your own Bible, you can follow on the screens. James 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one? You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith, apart from works, is dead. Now, I told you James is direct, right? <laughs> he doesn't mix words. He just says it straightforward. And there's some things he says in here that have really confused, challenged, even divided Christians over the years. Because remember, what James is primarily concerned with is this. If you believe, what does that look like in your life? 
That's the whole business of works. But he makes a statement in here that sounds like he's contradicting things that are said in other places in the New Testament. If you've been around here for any length of time, you know at Chapel Street Church we talk about God's grace. You heard Andrew talk about it. We talk about experiencing grace, growing in faith, and making an impact. Grace means we're saved not by our own effort. You don't earn God's love. You don't achieve God's love. You don't acquire it by your, your good life. He gives it freely. You surrender to him. But it sounds like James is saying something different, doesn't it? Like he's saying, well, actually, you have to be, you have to measure up. You have to do the work. This is the problem of faith. The problem of faith. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, says it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves, not by works of righteousness so that none of you can boast. That sounds like it stands in opposition to what James says. Verse 24, James 2, 24. This is sort of the, the central problem passage, if you will, or at least it sounds like it. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, for many, this is a difficult verse. You see a person is justified. That word justified, that's Bible speak for how a man or woman is made right with God. How is a person put right with their creator, which presumes we're not right with him? Well, how does that happen then? How do you get in right relationship with God? That's what justified means. And James says, you're justified by works and not by faith alone. Well, the Apostle Paul in Romans 3, 28 famously says something different. For we hold that one is justified by what? Faith apart from the works of the law. How do you reconcile James 2, 24 with Romans 3, 28 and other passages like that? This, is, this has been a problem for many. But James and Paul are not contradicting each other. In fact, they're friends. We read in, in Galatians 1 and Acts 21 that P James visits Paul. Paul actually visits James to be taught, to be instructed, to be commissioned, to consult and talk about the good things God is doing in the world. They're not at odds with each other. They're not fighting over what salvation really means. In these two verses, they're actually asking and answering a kind of different question about the Christian life. Paul's talking about how a person is justified or made right, vertical. James is talking about what it looks like once you are made right. They're different things. It's sort of like if, if, if you go to the doctor and the doctor says, you know, you really need to start exercising more. You need to start maybe jogging or, or uh, that's what he said to me. Maybe in a few he wouldn't say that, right? <laughs> start jogging, riding the bike, you know, exercising more. Somebody else goes to the same doctor, the doctor says, you need to slow down and stop. Stop exercising, it's bad for you. Are these contradictory messages from the same doctor? No. One might be, uh, you know, a little overweight. The other maybe has a stress fracture in their foot. The point is they're looking at something from a different angle. Paul's talking about how does a person who's sinful and far from God get made right? James is talking about how do you know someone's put right? What does it look like in their life? How does it show up? Charles Spurgeon wrote, on a commentary or sermon on this very passage said it is not the presence of the apple which makes the tree alive but it is the live tree that produces the apple that's 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 exactly what how we reconcile james and paul it's not the apple which makes the tree alive works don't make you saved but a saved life a justified person a live tree produces something fruit works so works don't save you but the kind of faith that does save you shows up somehow in your life. You, you can't come to Jesus. You can't really meet Jesus. You can know about him. You can intellectually agree with him. You can read about him. But you can't truly encounter Jesus and not be changed. And there'd be no difference. We just talked about over 100 children that prayed a prayer to respond to the grace of Jesus. The job now is to follow up and disciple those kids and teach them, instruct them. 20 years from now, if nothing changes in their life, if there's no difference, we have to look back and say, well, maybe that was just an emotional response at VBS. If you are the same anxious, fearful, resentful, bitter, short-tempered, selfish, stingy person 20 years from now that you are now, James is saying, like, how do you know someone's put right? It'll show up somehow. It doesn't save you, but it's evidence that you belong to Jesus. Because if you really meet him, something's got to change. That's what he does. Jesus changes things. 
We'll come back to that. Okay, so what's this authentic, genuine faith really mean? James gives us several negative examples and a couple positive examples to follow. First thing he talks about is saving faith. Saving faith. This is the first thing James talks about. He implies it's possible to have a kind of faith that does not save, which is a little troubling. Look at verses 14 and verse 17. We'll put those two verses together. Verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? And then he asks this question, can such faith save him? Two questions. What good is it and can it save you? And then verse 17. So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. He answers his own question. It's a little troubling, really. The key question, what good is it? What good is it? He's saying it's possible to claim to have faith, to say the right things, and not really know Jesus, and not really be put right with God. He calls this dead faith. It's, you know, some of you have studied the five love languages. Anybody ever studied the love languages? Uh, that book, you know, uh, is it just me? You know the love languages, five love languages? It's good for couples. My love languages are, are, are physical touch and words of affirmation. My wife's are uh, acts of service and quality time. To her, talk is cheap. So I'm always saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. And she's like, yeah, really? Show me. I'm like, but I said it 25 times, you know. James is in a sense saying, show me. Show me what you believe. What good is it, he says. Now, in between these verses, he has this little uh, hypothetical scenario, right? He says, what if one of you sees a brother or sister? That means a fellow believer, presumably somebody you know, or you know they belong to the family of faith. So not a random homeless person, although that, you ought to love them and serve them too, but to make it more poignant, somebody you would know, a brother or sister in Christ, you see them, and they're, um, they're not well-dressed. Now, well, you might think, well, that means they're wearing knockoff clothing. No, no, it's not what that means. They're not wearing Walmart you know, shirts. It means they don't have enough clothing to protect themselves from the elements. And they're not, well, they don't have enough food for the day, daily food. They're starving. Got the picture? Somebody you know belongs to Jesus. You see them, and they don't have enough clothing to protect them or food to eat for the day. And you walk by and you say, God bless you. Stay warm. Don't skip lunch. You know? You know what you ought to do? Stop skipping meals. I hope you, I hope you have a great meal today and you do nothing about it. We would all acknowledge that would be, it's almost awkward to say. You'd think, well, I would never do that. It sounds ridiculous. And James is saying, yeah, it does sound ridiculous, and so does the person who says they belong to Jesus, and nothing changes. It's the same thing. Years ago, I was, uh, I was invited to teach an adjunct class at Wheaton College uh, to undergraduate students who were majoring in Christian education. The class was on the Bible and ministry. I think they had, but one of the professors took ill, one was on sabbatical, and they had asked other people, and they were, <laughs> they were desperate, so they called if I would do this, you teach this class. And it met uh, twice a week early in the morning, it was in the, uh, the winter semester, and I was going for my first class with these students, and it was cold that morning. And I was driving there to Wheaton College from my home in Batavia, I stopped by Dunkin' Donuts and got a couple big boxes of donuts and a big box of coffee because... I don't know if I was a good teacher, but I figured I could win him over, you know, with food and coffee <laughs> on the first day of class, make a good first impression. And I'm walking up the steps of the Billy Graham Center. If you've ever been there, the Billy Graham Center, right? M built in his honor for his name, houses the Department of Evangelism and Christian Ministry. And I'm walking up the steps there, holding coffee and donuts. And I see this guy in the vestibule between the two outer door and the inner door in the, in the corner. He's not a college student, obviously. He's huddled up against the cold. Didn't look very good, didn't smell very good, and I passed by him holding donuts and coffee on my way to teach a class about the Bible and ministry. Got to the elevator, pressed the button with my elbow, and heading up to my floor where my class is, first day of class with donuts and coffee to teach the class to students about the Bible and ministry. I get into the class, and I'm thinking over about my notes, and it just like, it dawns on me. There's a guy down there who might be hungry and a little cold, and I've got coffee and donuts, but I've got to teach a class about ministry to these students. It is as if it was God said, you idiot. <laughs> now, he, he doesn't, maybe he doesn't call you idiot. Sometimes he does to me. It's loving. He says it nicely, but he says it to me, right? <laughs> what are you doing, in other words? Well, I got in the elevator, went back down, and gave the man some donuts and coffee. Angels didn't sing. Birds didn't, like, you know, like the, the sky didn't open up, but it was a simple act of love. And I would have and have many times passed right by. God got my attention that time. James is saying, like, you know, it sounds ridiculous, right? How could you pass by? 
But so does it say, it sound ridiculous to say, I believe in Jesus. I go to church, but not, my life doesn't reflect it in any way. That's what he's getting at here. It's no coincidence that James uses this scenario to illustrate his point. In chapter 1, verse 27, he says, authentic, genuine faith is care for widows and orphans. And later, earlier in chapter 2, we did saw this last week, he uses a scenario, right, about somebody who comes in uh, who's rich and wealthy, and somebody comes in who's poor, and how we favor one over the other. 1 John chapter 3 tells us this, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how can God's love abide in him? Now, James is not saying you earn God's favor when you're kind to the poor. He's saying you have God's favor in Christ, therefore, be kind to the poor. How can you not? One of the hallmarks of genuine saving faith is caring for people in need. Is your heart changing that way? It doesn't mean that if you've ever walked by somebody or ever ignored somebody that you're not saved. Don't misunderstand. But I want to ask this question. Is your heart beginning to change for people? Are you beginning to see people differently? You begin to look through, remember last week, Luke chapter 7, if you didn't hear it, you can get it on the app, you can see and listen to the sermon. Luke chapter 7, do you see this woman, right? Are you seeing people the way Jesus sees them? That's one of the evidences of, a, of saving faith, of a heart that's being changed. Now in the next verse, James anticipates an argument from somebody who hears this. But some will say, he says verses 18 and 19, but some will say what? You have faith and I have works. In other words, this person, James is sort of anticipating. Now, maybe James is passive-aggressive here, and he knows the guy. Somebody would say, I don't know, somebody like uh, Bill. Bill might say, you know, probably not. He's just saying in general, somebody might try to separate these two things, meaning if you have faith, I have works, they're not the same thing. We shouldn't connect them at all. This is an argument that could be made. James' response to this argument is predictably very direct and straightforward. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I'll show you my faith by what I do. In other words, by my works. We'll come back to the rest of what he says in a minute. Let me use this chair as an illustration. Right? It's not, it's not unique to me. People have used this illustration before. But if this chair represents faith, and if I said, do you have faith that this chair will hold you? Now, I weigh, I weigh north of 200 pounds. Let's put it there, right? Okay? It's holding me, Right? Do you have faith this chair would hold you? Yes, I have faith the chair would hold me. Yes, I, I, I believe it would hold me. I believe the intellectual properties of the chair, the construction of the chair. I agree that that chair is strong enough to hold me. All right, have a seat. Well, can we just stand and talk? Have a seat, James says. Place your faith somewhere. It's not a matter of talk. This is his point in the very next verse, in verse 19. You believe there's one God? This is the central affirmation of the Jewish faith, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He says, you believe there's one God? You acknowledge the, 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 the true God? Good. Even demons do that, and they shudder. Here's what he's saying. Intellectual assent, agreement with theological propositions, does not save you. That's shocking and hard for some of you, us to hear. Intellectual agreement with propositional truth doesn't save you, doesn't change you. Eventually, you gotta have a seat. You gotta place that intellectual assent somewhere. This is the point he's making. A.W. Tozer says, the devil is a better theologian than any of us, and he is a devil still. The demons know more about the Bible than you do. They're real and they know who God is. And you read the New Testament and the demons acknowledge Jesus, call him by the right title, and, and recognize his authority over them. It doesn't save them. Because they don't know about the relationship offered. They don't know about his love and his grace. They know who he is. They agree with who he is. They understand. In fact, that when the disciples are confused and not getting it, the demons know who Jesus is. James says it. They have no idea what awaits us in relationship with God if we surrender. That's how faith and works go together. Second, we read befriending faith. 
James gives a couple of fascinating examples in the Old Testament. First is Abraham. Now, if you grew up in church, you know about Abraham, right? We sing songs about Abraham. If you didn't grow up in church, <laughs> it's okay, right? But how many of you know the Father Abraham song, right? Father Abraham had many sons. Sing with me. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all pray. You know, this is lame. Come on, sing. I'm not a worship leader, right? <laughs> right? If you don't know the song, you're like, what is going on in here? That's okay, don't worry, right? We sing songs about Father Abraham. But do you remember the song, Rahab the Prostitute? No. Prostitute Rahab. Remember that song? No, you don't remember it because there isn't one, right? <laughs> James gives two examples. One obvious to any Jew. <laughs> yeah, Father Abraham, I get that. And one that would be like, uh, I don't remember. That's not in, is that in the story? For a very important reason. One is the patriarch. One is a prostitute. One is the, the father of faith. One is a pagan woman. But what's, what do they share? They did something with their faith. They put some action. They trusted God with what he said. So it doesn't matter your pedigree, your background, your education, your family, right, the church you grew up in. Will you put your trust in God into action? Will you take a seat and trust him in his grace and his love? That's what they shared. That's why they're both listed, and I think it's intentional. Two extremes, right? What do we mean befriending faith? Let me read verses 21 to 23 again for us. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. So much in here. James is saying, he's quoting Genesis 15, 6, which, by the way, the Apostle Paul quotes on numerous occasions. Genesis 15, 6 is the central theme of Abraham's life. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. His belief in God, that's faith, was credited to him. God said, because of your faith, I, I count it to you as righteousness. Like justified simply means you're made right with me by believing me. How do we know Abraham believed God? How do you know Abraham believed God? Well, he said he did. No. He gives a very specific example, the pinnacle of Abraham's life. The, the covenant promised Abraham is, I'm going to bless you by giving you a son. But Abraham's 95 and Sarah is 90, or 90, 99, 95. They're old and wrinkly, way past, all shriveled up, way past childbearing age. God says, I'm going to do it. And he does. And Isaac is the son of the promise, like the physical representation of God's fulfillment of his promise. And then God says, offer your son to me. Now, we don't have time to get into this. It sounds terrifying to us. But there's reasons why this happened, and Abraham does. He takes his son up to the mountain, and God provides a substitute, a sacrifice. Abraham believed God. How do we know he believed God? Because he did something based on what God said he would do. He says to his own son, on the way up, the Lord himself will provide. I don't know how, I don't exactly know when, but God will do it. I'm trusting him. And he does. He provides a ram and a thicket to die in his place. And that story about the substitute is a, is a real story which foreshadows the great substitute, Christ at the cross, the Son, the beloved Son, the firstborn of all creation who died in your place. God the Father, not Abraham the father of faith, God the Father offers up his Son, his only Son, for you and for me. We celebrate that a moment ago at the table. And it is through the sacrifice of the Son that you can be called a friend of God. We used to sing that song, I am a friend of God. My good friend Scott Salvati said when his son Nick was a little boy, he said, Dad, why does God call me Fred? He thought we were singing, I am a friend of God. He calls me Fred. <laughs> I just think that's funny. It's not part of the sermon. <laughs> calls you friend. Think about that. God calls you his friend. His son, his daughter, his friend. How? Through the sacrifice of his son. So, what, so James is not confused on what grace is. He's saying if you believe that, you do something with it. You act on it. Take a seat. Right? So intellectual assent. Yes, I believe Christ died for me. Yes, I believe that he died in my place. Yes, I believe that I'm forgiven. Okay, well, what, do you, what does your life look like? Saying it, intellectually believing it's one thing. Surrendering to it, letting it in, trusting him with it is another. Another altogether. Faith is a relational word, friends. 
It's not like you pray a prayer once upon a time at VBS or because you're scared one night in, in, in your room or, and you just forget about it. And you have this card called faith that you put in your back pocket and it stays there until you get to the pearly gates and you pull it out and go, got faith. That's not how it works. Faith is a dynamic thing. It's active. God is looking for progress from you, not perfection. We say it's okay not to be okay around here. It's all right for where you are is the slogan, right? It's okay not to be okay here. God doesn't want you to stay that way, but it's okay. He wants progress in your faith, growth, change. How does that happen? Take a seat. Step into it. I read in the introduction to St. Benedict's Rule where he talks about prayer, and he says it's good to read about prayer. It's good to talk about prayer. It's good to philosophize about prayer. It's good to debate about prayer. It's better to pray. Right? Some of us read and talk and philosophize about this stuff. But we need to take a seat. We need to step in. Let me read to you, we're talking now about the last part, living faith. Faith is an invitation to know, to love, to trust the God who made you and the God who loves you. Faith is not static, it's dynamic. He's inviting you into a living faith. Listen to verse 26, the last verse of this passage in chapter 2. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Remember body and spirit? We talked about this back in the series on the Holy Spirit. Ruach, the breath of life that animates us, that gives us life. Our, our flesh is dead until the breath of God, the spirit of God enters into us and gives us life. James says the same way that's true, your faith apart from your action is dead. It's of no use. This is echoing what the Apostle Paul says throughout the New Testament in Romans 1.17. We read these words from Romans 1.17. For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, and as, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. That phrase, live by faith. Again, in Galatians 2.20, the Apostle Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. Life by faith. A living faith. And faith doesn't end with salvation. We use the phrase step of faith, right? Let me go back to this chair for a minute. It's not just salvation. It's not just once upon a time trust Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And some of you here need to do that. Some of you here haven't ever for the first time come and sat down in the grace and love of Jesus Christ and said, I surrender, I receive. You haven't done that. And James is calling you to. God is calling you to. But even for those of you who are believers, this chair can represent all kinds of actions, right? What does the chair represent to you? What is God calling you to take action in, to trust his word in? You have a relationship in your life that's broken, you've been trying to fix it in your own strength? And you know what the right answer is. Maybe it's to get out of it. Maybe it's to confess your own sin in it. Maybe it's to offer forgiveness you've been withholding in it. Whatever the case, right? What is James say, God saying to us in the book of James? Take a seat, right? Step in, trust me. Do what I'm asking you to do. Maybe it's your future. I know a couple of brothers here who have lost jobs recently. What are you, is God calling you to take some action? To trust him in some way? Maybe it's your family. Maybe you've got issues with your kids or in your marriage. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe God is calling you to be generous and you're going, yes, but, but my 401k, right? But my future. Don't, I, I don't, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty as a pastor asking for money. I'm saying maybe God is saying to you, I need to free you because you're in prison of, of fear and you're hoarding. And the only way I can free you is by releasing your grip to give. And that's, come sit down, take a seat, step into my grace, trust me that I can provide. I don't know what it is, right? But we've all got that thing, that place in our life where we're like, intellectually, I believe the Bible says it's better to give than to receive, right? Intellectually, I believe that I should offer forgiveness, but I'm holding on. And I think we're being called to take a seat, to trust him. This is what living faith means. It's not just something you, you say you believe once a week. It's our life, friends. 
There's a little boy named Eli Miller. In, in fact, Eli's dad, Alex, is, it works for the King County Cougar Stadium. Uh, and he's part of our connection to have stadium service there. But Eli, his favorite thing after the second service, I look forward next hour to do this with him. He comes down here after the service. He gets up on the stage where they're clearing off the music instruments. And he runs to the back by the drum set. And he goes, one, two, three. And he sprints as fast as he can from all the way back here. So come up here, Tim. Catch me. Ready? One, two, three. And he gets right here and he just jumps like this. Now he's only about, you know, size of a softball. And I catch him. And I catch him and put him down. His first couple times, his mother's like, <laughs> oh, okay, you know, right? Now it's like a tradition. He doesn't even hesitate. He runs full speed and sprints off the end of the stage into my arms, and I catch him every time. Now, when he gets to be 15, I think we'll stop doing this, maybe. <laughs> but the point is, I want to be like Eli in my spirit with God. I want to be that kid. Just run full speed in the arms of God. No hesitation. I'm the hot, always. I sort of go, ah, oh, oh, you know? But I just want to jump off and not fear. That's what the cross means. You can trust him. He's good. He's not going to let you down. James says, you talk about faith, fine. Show me. Put it into action. Take the step that God is asking you to take. What are you waiting for? What are you holding back for? What are you really afraid of? This is my heart for us, Chapel Street Church, that you would so know and be convinced of the love of God for you that would be so tangible in your life that you couldn't, it would just spill out of you and you would be fearless in whatever God calls you to do. Even simple little things like saying I'm sorry or I forgive you or being generous or giving you some, t- some time away to somebody else or loving the person next door. Whatever that is, right? That you would be so confident, that's faith, in the love of God for you in Christ that you can't not trust him that you're fearless in your life. And and I'm not saying that to you as one who's already there. I'm in process too. I want to be like Eli. I want us to be like Eli. Run into his arms because he's good. Let's pray. Father, forgive us for being all talk in our faith. By your spirit, embolden us Help us to sit down and rest in your grace. To trust you with whatever it is you're asking us to do. And we know what that is. Help us to be people who live by faith, not by sight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.